transmitted via blood, um, other things that are still out there to get us, and recognizing what EHC is providing for us to protect us. We are going to start with a video from OSHA. Hello, I'm Secretary of Labor Lynn Martin. I'm here to introduce the Occupational Safety and Health Administration Standard on Bloodborne Pathogens. The standard, which is effective as of March 6, 1992, is a pioneering step by the Department of Labor to protect all of us from bloodborne pathogens, such as the HIV virus and the hepatitis B virus. It covers an estimated 5.6 million workers, most in the healthcare industry, but others in businesses such as research laboratories, law enforcement departments, funeral homes, and fire and rescue operations. It is vital that we protect America's working men and women from the risks of bloodborne pathogens. The following presentation explains the new standard, tells how it will affect you, and how it will help you do your job while dealing with these hazards. Questions on the OSHA video? Okay, so it's covering one and a half million firefighters and EMTs, 600,000 law enforcement officers, 500,000 corrections officers. So we are not the only ones who have to do this every year. So in the meat of it, what is a bloodborne pathogen? It's some kind of organism present in the blood that's going to cause disease in us. Now you guys remember that biohazard symbol? Um, been around since 1966. It's going to be anywhere where we have something that could hurt you. So be on the lookout for it. How BBPs are transmitted, your body coming into contact with contaminated blood from someone else, or OPIM, other potentially infectious material. I have some of them listed up there, CSF, what is that? <coughs> Cerebral spinal fluid, okay? So where are we gonna see that? Like real world, where are we gonna see CSF? Ears, a, a head trauma, okay? So once the brain swells, it doesn't have anywhere to go because of the skull, so it's gonna push the fluid out. So we could come into contact with that in their ears. Okay, synovial fluid, that's for joints. Um, so if we have, again, another bad trauma involving joints, we might see it there. Amniotic fluid, pretty obvious, where we're gonna come into contact with that. Pericardial, what's that around? The heart, so that's an easy one. Plural, the lungs, okay. So unlikely that we'll regularly come into contact with either one of those. But the last bullet point there, any body fluid with gross visible blood in it, okay. So we have these calls. There is the potential for us to be exposed to these. Good news is we need like a perfect storm to happen. We need four things to happen in order for us to be exposed. We need to have a pathogen needs to be present. We need to have a sufficient quantity of it. There has to be enough of it that's going to infect us. We have to be susceptible to it, as in we didn't get vaccinated against it. And there has to be an entry site for it to pass through. We have to be able to come in contact with it. So that's a lot of different things that have to happen for us to be exposed. Unfortunately, there's a lot of different ways we could come into contact with it. So that's why we're here. Needle sticks, still the most common. CDC says 80% of our occupational exposures are through needle sticks. Good news is back in 2000, they had a huge um, act, the Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act, and it required the sharps containers. It required the needles to be self-sheeting so they go back inside so that the needle's not sticking out. Since that happened, obviously, exposures have gone significantly down. Um, but we do have the potential to be exposed. However, just because you're exposed does not mean that you're necessarily infected. You're potentially infected, but there are some steps that we can take so that hopefully it doesn't get that far, and that's the post-exposure prophylaxis post meaning after. So after you've been exposed, there are steps that you can take and that's what the rest of this is about. Obviously the first thing that we're gonna to have to do is transfer patient care, okay? If we're in the back of the rig, we're seeing diabetic call, somebody's combative, ALS is there trying to give them D50, we get inadvertently sick. The first thing that we have to do is make sure that someone else is doing the job that we were just doing. We can't abandon our patient, okay? So we have to make sure we transfer patient care. Then we immediately need to wash the area. Soap and water does wonders, okay? Then we're going to seek medical attention. We'll talk more at the end about the Erie County um, exposure plan, which is what Edgarsville has adopted to follow, within one to two hours, okay? So the critical part there is that if you get exposed, you immediately tell an officer, okay? Then they're going to test the source patient. If the patient had told you 
I have hep C, I have hep B, I have HIV. They're going to test him. If he refuses to do so, there is the Ryan White Act, which can be activated. A judge can order him to be tested within 48 hours. So they're going to test that source individual, and then obviously they're going to test you. And then, depending on how those tests turn out, you could wind up being on an antibiotic regimen. So that treatment usually lasts four weeks. Um, you're on two different drugs, costs somewhere around $2,000. Again, not your cost out of pocket, but I'm just it goes to show how expensive treating it can be, which is why we're here to try and prevent it before we get to that stage. Make sense? So here are some of the common bloodborne pathogens we are going to talk about again, Hep B, Hep C, and HIV. So hepatitis, hep, the, the prefix hep means what? No. Yeah. Liver. EMTs should know that. Yeah, liver. Okay. HEPA is the prefix for liver, like card cardio is the prefix for heart. HEPA is for liver. So HEP B and HEP C are both contagious liver diseases. HEP B can be acute or chronic. They can have it their whole life. Well, it can be active right now. Um, can survive outside the body for up to a week, and that's where we have a concern, especially in healthcare. Okay. So if our patient you know, has a bloody hand and he's getting it on, you know, our backboard or our house bag or our suction or our AED. Okay, that has to be decontaminated because that disease could live on that equipment for a week after that patient's long gone. All right, and we've seen how many patients since then. So that's why it's so important that we decon our, our equipment. 70% of adults will experience symptoms from hep B, very flu-like, but one of the telltale signs of hepatitis is jaundice. What does that look like? Yellow. It's very obvious when you see someone who's, who has a liver issue, they, they look very yellow. Yeah, yes, we are. This lighting isn't helping. Um, 2000 to 4000, that stat hasn't changed. I couldn't find anything more current. Die each year from Hep B related disease. Good news for us is that there's a vaccine that's 95% effective. And as you'll see, we get later into agricultural requirements they're required to offer it to their employees, okay, so at no charge. Again, I'll say it probably five more times throughout this, prevention is the best way to avoid getting exposed. So the vaccine is three shots delivered over six months, month one, month two, month six, um, and then you can take tighter in the future just to verify that you are still immune. But the FDA approved it in 1981, and as you see, what happened? With the numbers in 1981, they tanked. So it just goes to prove that taking care of yourself prophylactically, preventing it before having an exposure, can make a significant difference. The problem with Hep B, okay, is that it's 50 to 100 times more infectious than HIV. I can't emphasize enough cleaning the equipment, taking a hype wipe, taping, taking some of our um, Anavac spray and cleaning that equipment off if there's the potential that that patient got something on there. Hep C, again, another contagious liver disease. Mm -hmm. Your word. What? My word, yes. Okay, so the online word is Savannah. Ignore that. Uh, so Hep C, another contagious liver disease, also could be acute or chronic. Um, 75 to 85% will develop chronic, whatever the point of that is for the people who are watching it online who are going to do the online version, have to watch the video. So the quiz for the online thing will ask them what the online word is. I'm getting smarter. Uh, good news for Hep C is that the majority of patients do not show signs and symptoms. Bad news is there is no vaccine for Hep C. Okay. Two times as common in African Americans as it is in Caucasians, and it's the leading cause of liver transplants is Hep C. Okay. Um, you can see this again because there's no vaccine; it didn't have a significant drop like Hep B did. And what's more alarming is that it's going back up. Why do you think that is? IV drug use. IV drug use. Share needles. Okay, especially among the 15 to 24 year olds. Moving into HIV, this is the virus that can lead to AIDS. This, you should just automatically be thinking of a compromised immune system. Okay, even if it does develop into AIDS, a patient doesn't die from AIDS, they die from whatever disease they had that their immune system couldn't fight off. A lot of times is pneumonia. 
okay? Um, the human body can never get rid of HIV. You are a 100% chronic carrier, okay? Good news for us, it does not survive outside the body. There are lab tests where, you know, people are able to grow it in a Petri dish, but for our intents and purposes, in the free hospital care environment, it cannot live outside the body the way Hep B can stay on our equipment for a week. So that's good news for us. These are the absolute most current stats um, from the CDC. They just actually updated the page yesterday. Um, 50,000 people get infected every year. Over a million people are living in the U.S. with HIV right now. Um, what's alarming here is one out of eight people don't know they have it because they're not experiencing any of the signs and symptoms yet. Mm -hmm. Why is that so alarming? Because they're passing it on, because they don't know. Okay, so getting tested is the key here. Um, they, you know, doctor's office, community clinics, you can pretty much go anywhere and get an HIV test these days. Our healthcare risk of infection is 0.3%. I'll do that math for you. It's one in 300 if you get stuck with a needle. You would have to be stuck with 300 needles um, to probably catch the disease. Through 2001, there have only been five documented cases of healthcare-related transfer of HIV, and there haven't been any since 1999. Okay, again, because of that needle stick act requiring the sharks, instead of putting the needles in the bench seat, you know, now we have to put them in appropriate containers, okay? There is no vaccine for HIV right now, still. Of course, they're pumping tons of money into it, trying to find one. But while there is no vaccine, there is pre-exposure prophylaxis. So our post-exposure prophylaxis was we think we got stuck, how are we gonna take care of ourselves now? Pre-exposure <coughs> is a daily pill that they can give to patients to reduce their, reduce their risk of catching the disease in the first place. So it's a daily pill, they're targeting it at high target groups, okay? Um, incarcerations, male homosexuals, you know, any kind of confined living environment. So there is progress being made, but, you know, it's still a major issue, especially in third world countries, okay? Um, world AIDS Day, you know, they're trying to get to zero um, new babies born that have AIDS. Again, they're just perpetuating the problem. You know, you have AIDS, you're pregnant, you give birth to a, a female who then grows up, gets pregnant, gives birth to another female, and it just keeps going. So. World AIDS Day, you know, a lot of celebrities are into it and they're putting a lot of money into it, so knock on wood, hopefully they will find a cure soon. And some other significant infectious diseases that we might be exposed to, not necessarily transferred by blood, but this stuff is out there and it's gonna get us, so we need to know about it, okay? Just an overview, tuberculosis, MRSA, Ebola, and the brand new one just put in for you today, Zika, okay? So that's what the mosquito is over there for. So TB, we're gonna talk a little bit about this one because we are potentially exposed to this. Um, this is the world's deadliest disease. Again, not in the US, but up to one third of the world's population is infected with this. So you can see the stats up there. I'm not gonna go over them. What's concerning about TB is that it's spread through the air. So people cough, right? People sneeze those nuclei and the droplets that come out from the moisture when you sneeze or cough, they can remain in the air for six hours, all right? So if TB is not treated properly and quickly, it can be fatal. The good news is not everybody infected becomes sick. There's latent TB and there's active TB disease. Obviously, the active disease is worse for us, okay? because the bacteria are growing and living and the immune system can't fight them off. So that's the period when the patient is contagious, okay? So if we have anybody that we're taking care of that's coughing, if they even remotely mention that they've had TB, the prevention for us is the N95 respirator, okay? It looks very similar to a surgical mask, right? So it's not overwhelming. We're not talking about the respirators, you know, like a APR or PAPR where you have to put on canisters. It's very simple. Just put it on and protect yourself. If you're gonna wear an N95, put a surgical mask or a non-rebreather on your patient so that he can keep it to himself, okay? The skin test, this is what we get tested for annually, right? They put that little needle right under your skin. It makes that little bubble. Hopefully that little bubble goes away at the end of 24 hours. Um, if not, then you get a chest x-ray 
and further testing goes from there. Good news is there is treatment available for it, and that's why healthcare providers get that PPD done every year so that treatment can begin as soon as possible. Multiple drugs, usually six to nine months for the TB exposure. MRSA, it's nasty and it's everywhere. And it's so hard to contain. It just runs rampant <clears throat> in the hospitals, okay? It's a staph infection, but it's resistant <clears throat> to most of the antibiotics that we would normally treat infections with. It has learned, similarly to how I did, um, to grow and adapt to find a way to, to keep living, okay? Most infections that we might find in the community are gonna be skin infections like that. You know, and how you're gonna diagnose that that's MRSA instead of, you know, a bug bite that got infected or what else, you're not. What bottom line for this class, as some of you have already said, if it's wet and sticky and not yours, just don't touch it. That still applies here, okay? But again, just to have you be aware of it. Anybody who spends a lot of time in the hospitals, like I said, it's so hard to contain it in the hospitals. Um, a surgical wound, like if somebody has hip replacement or you know whatever, any kind of surgical wound or in their urine, and it just gets passed so easily through the healthcare providers. Okay, healthcare providers' hands are the number one mode of transmission for MRSA. The equipment, the doctor's stethoscope the remote controls for the TV, the remote control to call the nurse. The stuff is just nasty and it's hard to kill. Okay, so if you ever have a family member in a hospital, take some Lysol wipes with you. Um, you'll see if you go down like a nursing home, you know, we get calls here and you've seen it. There'll be isolation carts outside people's rooms, little silver carts that have buckets that have Tyvek suits, face shields, goggles, hair nets, booties. Okay, because we're trying to prevent those healthcare providers from taking it from one room to another. Patients who have um, bad MRSA will be in private rooms, but we're just there's so few private rooms at healthcare facilities that they wind up putting patients, two patients who have MRSA together, and it's just so hard to get rid of it, and the antibiotic to treat it is very expensive. Um, best protection, as with anything, wash your hands, wear your PPE. Ebola. When we did this the last time, it was kind of just emerging. Um, again, this is a, a rare virus, which is good, but it can be deadly, um, from infected sick animals, right? So there was an animal in the forest that some you know, tribal person cut up and served for dinner, and that's, that's how it gets passed on. So again, signs and symptoms, really nonspecific, very flu-like. Again, so hard for us to diagnose, but it's going to um, appear two to 21 days. So again, it's hard to pinpoint, oh, you know, 20 days ago I was in West Africa or I was in, you know, this airport, you know, O'Hare Airport where a flight from West Africa came in and I went to the bathroom after somebody before me did. It's, it's hard for them to track it. Um, but the fatality rate could be up to 50%. Um, as you see here, brand new stats from the World Health Organization as of today. Right. Um, they update it once a week. Total confirmed cases. Now these are cases that they're aware of. The World Health Organization is aware. Over 28,000. Total deaths, 11,000. Okay, so not quite 50% for the total, but it breaks it down by the country. If, you know, we're looking at, at West Africa, countries that probably most of us won't visit regularly. Um, in the US, we did have one patient die after he traveled to West Africa. When he came back, he was sick. The two nurses who took care of him also became infected. However, they recovered. Um, so that's good news. There is no proven treatment, no vaccine, still to this day. As of yesterday, there was an article that I found that Russia has apparently found a vaccine that has passed all the clinical trials, and they say that they're willing to share it with the Western labs without price gouging. So, um, it seems like we might be on the doorstep of getting a vaccine, which would be great. There's one of the CDC's flyers about Ebola. Um, there are dedicated rigs. Uh, Junior, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, Junior wasn't listening. Yeah, I was talking to you. Uh, the rig that Twin City has, the Ebola special training, special rig for Ebola. Do you have anything to contribute? No. No, great. 
<laughs> there are specialized resources. So the commercial ambulance carriers all had additional training in it. There are special rigs. Um, Except for him, he didn't get the training. Correct. So it seems. He's not getting this one either. So it seems. They have a rig that that's all it rolls out for. The, the partner will stay in. The supervisor will get the specialized rig. They have a deployment plan for it. Yes. So as does rural metro. So the commercial carriers, as did Erie County Department of Health, have a whole activation plan when this was just coming out, which is very similar to this, the Zika virus <coughs> that is now just all hitting the news, right? Neither Ebola nor Zika are new viruses. They've been around a long time ago, but now there's just a new resurgence, <coughs> resurgence of them. The Zika virus is spread by mosquitoes, okay? So again, common symptoms, flu-like symptoms, but special specific to Zika is conjunctivitis, which is like pink eye, or joint pain. It can last two to seven days. Um, there's the possible risk with, I bet you've seen some of the pictures on Facebook, of the, I don't even know how to say it, microcephaly, microcephaly. Yeah, microcephaly. Great, so their head is disproportionate to the size of their body. Um, it's not confirmed. This is all so brand new um, that they don't have a ton of information on it right now. Brazil, you know, where the Olympic Games are going, this is why everybody has this big concern. So as of, again, today, the World Health Organization just announced that they're going to invest $56 million into tracking it, epidemiology, creating a vaccine, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, a new re-emerging thing that we have to focus on now. So. As of last week, there were 52 travel-related cases in the U.S., people who went to the affected countries, um, but as of then, there still had been no deaths in the U.S. The prevention, everything that the CDC and the World Health Organization right now are pushing is preventing mosquito bites. So they talk about if you're going to be traveling, you know, you get the mosquito nets for your bed, um, you know, they have lists of the different kinds of sprays, the deep, the skin so soft, it's just preventing mosquito bites, and they're super pushing preventing standing water. So all these people who have little pools in their backyards or you know, rain that collects, that's where the female mosquitoes apparently like to hang out, and the eggs can <coughs> stay because of the water on the sides of these containers for a very long time. So again, brand new, just coming out with some of this information, so I'm sure we will hear more about it. Yes. Correct me. Uh, the information I saw was that this Egyptian uh, uh, mosquito that transmits the Zika virus mm -hmm. is immune to the and considered as a, a salad dressing. It was still, as of the World Health Organization this afternoon, DEEP is still listed as one of their suggested things. So I, I can't answer that effectively. I'm sorry. But those are the things we got to keep an eye out for. Our three common bloodborne pathogens that we think of, Hep B, Hep C, HIV, and then these other infectious diseases, MRSA, TB, Ebola, Zika, whatever's going to come out next. There's just nasty stuff out there. We have to take care of ourselves. It is Eggertsville's responsibility to provide us with a safe environment under this Code of Federal Regulations. So CFR 1910, 1030 um, talks about what Eggertsville, because they're our employer, has to do. Right? They have to make the Hep B vaccinations available to us at no cost. They have to make post-exposure evaluation and follow-up treatment if we get exposed available to us. Everything has to be labeled and signage available. There has to be information and training to the members, which is why we're here. And they have to maintain the medical and training records. So the next couple slides get more into specifics about that. Bottom line, how are we going to protect ourselves? from these bloodborne pathogens, get vaccinated for Hep B if you haven't already. Again, it's got a 95% effective rate. Um, since 1991, when FDA approved it, the, the rate of new Hep B incidences has gone down 82%. So certainly, again, prevention is the best method that we can go there. Otherwise, wear PPE. Just protect yourself on every single call. If you have open lesions, especially this time of year, it's dry, your skin is cracking, You've got those hangnails that you're biting or picking. Stuff can live outside the body. I told you up to seven days for the hep B. Why would you expose yourself to that for a, you know, a pair of gloves that cost three cents? 
we have all this equipment available, it's Eggersville's responsibility to have all this equipment available, use it. Okay. The next best thing we can do is hand washing. Okay. The most effective way to prevent the spread of infection. You'll notice outside at Westwood or whatever it's calling itself these days, um, or any of the hospitals outside every room is an antibac station. Okay, because some of the providers can't hand wash as you go in and out of 20 rooms that they're taking care of at a time. The antibac is a temporary solution, but hand washing is the best way to prevent the spread of disease. So when you need to wash your hands, I don't really think we need to spend a lot of time going over this, but anytime you're preparing food, you're in the bathroom, you're taking care of someone who's sick, you're taking care of a child's diapers, you know, I mean, you have to really ask yourself rhetorically, are you really washing your hands as much as you should? And even if you are, are you doing it properly? The CDC has a recommended way for how we are going to wash our hands. Of course, we're not going to use a food prep sink. We're going to go into a bathroom sink to do it. Clean running water, warm or cold. We don't want hot. Why don't we want hot? It dries it out and it opens the pores. Okay. So warm or cold, we're going to put our soap on it. We're going to make some bubbles. Okay. The recommended time is 15 to 20 seconds that you're gonna be making that lather. I mean, that's a long time. You know, when you think about, like I see it, I'm so much more cognitive of it now, but you know, if I'm out at a restaurant, you see somebody in the bathroom and they turn the water on for a second, run their hands over it, turn it back off, why bother? You've accomplished nothing. Um, so 20 seconds that you should have that good lather, obviously then rinse it off, rinse your hands well, and then use a, use a clean towel to dry it. Um, lots of recommendations I found today on how long you should keep like your personal bathroom towels out. Just and there's there's no official opinion from anybody on how long that is. I found a lot of three days. Some people said five days. But just think all the stuff that you just washed off your hand, you're putting on that towel. You know that's why. Do you remember a couple years ago, Kleenex came out with those hand towels that you could pull out of the boxes. So a lot of people are putting those in their home now instead of having the hand towels there and having to wash them so consistently. If you are in a situation on a call where you're using Anabac, the squirt bottles that we have in the rigs, again, that's just a temporary solution. When you get back to the firehouse, you should be washing. Soap and water, again, does wonders. So how do you protect yourself from bloodborne pathogens when you are in service? Um, we already know we have all this equipment provided to us, but what about when you're at home in your personal life? I always like to try and make the bridge between how things apply when we're at work and when we're at home. So, you know, lots of these bloodborne pathogens are sexually transmitted. So uh, know your partner's history. Don't have unprotected sex. Um, don't share like personal hygiene items like razors are the worst. Um, if you see that, what is it, that hairy shaving club now? Has anybody seen that commercial? The shave a day or dollar a day, whatever it is, you know, and the razor is all grody and talking. And that's, that's what they look like. If you look at like one of those disposable razors, they just, you know, pieces of skin, pieces of people's hair, you're going to share that with somebody else and they're going to cut into their skin with it. It's just not clean. <coughs> don't share needles, obviously. Okay. At that measure, don't do drugs. Is, is, is a good idea. And if you're going to get a tattoo, make sure you're doing research on the shop. Um, they will have very clearly um, displayed their license that proves that they have passed the Department of Health um, inspection. So a good thing to keep an eye out for. There's CFR 1910, 130 again. This standard protects workers who can reasonably anticipate it to come into contact with blood or other potential infectious materials during their job. This was part of that OSHA video that we watched. This came into effect in 1992. So the requirements for Eggersville, um, establish an exposure control plan, update it annually. I take care of that. Implement the use of universal precautions or PPE, which is all the stuff we have up here. Engineering controls, we're gonna go through. Those are our sharks containers, our garbage cans, and um, provide PPE. So our SOP review for Eggersville. These are just the bullet points of the, all the different topics that the Eggersville SOP talks about, and it goes through them individually. So, firefighters be instructed annually. That's why we're here, okay? That's why we're recording it for future use, and what an ideal time to put in the buzzword Broncos. Um, 
Universal precautions have to be followed at every patient care call. We're not good at this, okay? And it, it's unlikely that anybody can say that 100% of the time they have the appropriate PPE. I think we've gotten better with gloves. I think Adam and I have seen that we've been ordering more boxes of gloves, which means we're using them more, which is good. And even if you take them off the truck, throw them in your pocket, thinking that you're gonna have patient care and you wind up doing the PCR, or you wind up just carrying the equipment, who knows where that stuff has been? The clipboard, right? We put it down on somebody's kitchen table. We put it down on somebody's couch. That house bag, we're putting it down on somebody's carpet, right? Or somebody's kitchen floor. When's the last time that was cleaned? So even though you're not providing direct hands-on care, why would you risk taking that home? Put a pair of gloves on, okay? Uh, the exposure control policy is reviewed <coughs> annually. I take care of that again. Any exposure needs to be reported immediately. And I have seen an increase in that, and I'm sure the chiefs can attest to that, that you know, we've been getting suddenly an influx of, I got blood on my shorts, I, I need, to, how do I take care of these? Or somebody puked on my shoes, what am I gonna do now? So I can say in the last six months, I've had three of those instances, and out of the past, I don't know, four or five years that I've been the EMS captain, I think I've only had one. So that's good, we're getting the word out, we're, we're taking care of ourselves, um, and immediately letting someone know so that we can take care of it. Our engineering work practice controls at Edwardsville, we have hand washing facilities available, so we have the little bathroom in the truck bay so that we're not bringing it into the area. Similarly to how Tom talked last week about you know, not bringing bunker gear, why are you gonna carry all those carcinogens into the training area? Why would you bring all those bloodborne pathogens into our kitchen area and our dining area and our training area? Wash your hands out in the truck bay. We have the clean room for the cars and the trucks on that side of the truck bay, and we have the single bathroom in there too. So take care of it before you bring it in here. Employees need to wash hands, ASAP after removing their PPE. Sharps go in the appropriate containers. We have one in, oh well, soon to be seven, um, in seven one, but you know, use Twin Cities equipment as much as you can, all right? Um, and they all have that drawer under the bench seat where the, where the red box is. If you don't know where it is, let one of us know and we will be happy to show you. Eating and drinking is prohibited in area where there's potential bloodborne pathogen. All right, again, just think about it. This stuff is floating in the air from people coughing, people living on stuff for seven days. Just think about it before you eat, all right, or use the restroom. Gloves, masks, eye shields, goggles, all of this stuff is available to us. I do have because of what we're gonna be doing when I'm done here in a few minutes. Um, I'm not going to take the time to do the glove fitting because I'm sure that we have all cycled through that several times at this point. However, I do have every size glove available and if you're not sure what size you wear, please take the time to figure out what it is. Every truck has every size. Typically the boxes that you're gonna find are the large and the extra large because we're not doing any kind of specific medical treatment that requires us to have good dexterity. So, you know, you can always go bigger. So that's what we usually have the boxes of. But there are still Ziploc bags of smalls and mediums on all the trucks. So if you're not sure what size fits you best, I have them all here. Please come up on a break and, and try them out. Um, and of course, anytime that our gloves get soiled or torn or we're in between patients, we're of course going to change those gloves. More engineering practices that we have in our SOP. If a container becomes contaminated, it gets overpacked. So we're gonna put the Sharps container in another container, put the biohazard sticker on it, put the biohazard bag on it, call Stericycle to come pick it up. Okay. Any contaminated equipment must be deconned. Again, think about the stuff that we're putting in people's personal homes. Think about some of these elderly people, right, who have the heat cranked way up, right? And what, what happens in hot environments to bacteria? It just multiplies, all right? And we're putting our stuff, our soft padded suction unit and our soft padded house bag on their floor okay, or on their kitchen table. Just, just be cognizant of those things and we have the material available to clean up. Let an officer know and we will grab it. Okay. Biohazard labels are attached to any equipment. Our garbage can out in the truck bag has a big label on it. It's a yellow label. Um, of course there's red bags in it. Our sharps containers all have the biohazard symbol. So. Contaminated uniforms immediately go in a red bag. Like I said, we've gotten a few calls in the past couple months where something happened where one of our members got stuff on them. Just take it off. Have a spare set of clothes in your locker, in your trunk. 
take the stuff off here. Why would you bring that home? Do not put anything that gets exposed in your own personal washer that you're going to be washing your kids clothes with. Don't do that. Okay, take it off here. Put your bunker gear on if you have to. And go home and we'll red bag it here. We'll dispose of it and the district will replace it. It's very easy. Just again, let, let an officer know as soon as possible. PPE available, we have to consider that everything is contagious. The wet and sticky, not yours, don't touch it. Just assume the worst, okay? Because you never know, and there's no way for us to test it out in the field. So we have all of these materials available to us. The gloves in every size imaginable. The face shields, okay, that, that have some eye protection on the side, not much. But this, you're not going to wear this on every call, but if you're at one where there's a big splash hazard, if somebody's spewing arterial blood, if you're at a pregnancy call, certainly, cover up. We have the Tyvek suits available. We have the glasses and the goggles and the whatever you want to call them available for eye protection. We have the N95 mask. So all of this stuff is available on the trucks. If you're in a situation where you need it, put it on. That's what it's there for. It's not there so that the officer can go through and inventory it every month. It's there for us to use or to protect ourselves. Any garments contaminated by blood are to be removed ASAP. We already talked about that. Red bag it, let an officer know. <clears throat> Any potentially contaminated PPE removed prior to leaving the work area if possible. You'll see all of us typically, you know, are going to remove our gloves and put them in the Twin City rig because they have to decon it once they drop the patient off at the hospital. So get rid of that stuff while we're still there. Get in our rig. Put the anti back on, temporary fix, until we get back here and wash your hands there, okay? Leave all that stuff there. They have to go through a more rigorous decom process than ours is going to go through because it's not an ambulance and we're not transporting it, okay? Um, disposable gloves be replaced after any contamination or they lose their ability to function effectively. And that just, ha I mean, these are just super thin gloves, you know? So anything, you catch it on, on a piece of wood, like right here, I keep catching my shirt on, I notice. You know, we're walking through these people's homes. There's stuff sticking out everywhere. Just be careful. If they get compromised, replace them. We got plenty of gloves and house bags. Full face protection is required whenever there's splash or droplets. Again, for droplets, especially with TV, what am I putting on? N95 mask. Right, not just a regular surgical mask, an N95 mask, because it's going to filter out that bacteria. Housekeeping protocols in our SOPs, all equipment to be deconned after contact with blood or OPIM, any protective covering like garbage bags or linens, again, get red bags and replace. Trash bags routinely replaced in garbage cans. We don't leave things sitting out in the garbage cans if we have a big load, somebody's clothes or suction from a coat or something, we'll call Stericycle and schedule a pickup um, so it's not just sitting in the truck base stewing. Um, potentially contaminated glassware. Oh, if, you, if a glass breaks out in the truck bay for some reason, don't pick it up with your fingers. You know, get a, get a broom, take care of it. There's plenty of supplies to do that. Just, it's just a little common sense will go a long way when we're talking about more pathogens, okay? Regulated waste must be discarded of in these appropriate containers, puncture resistance, you know, those sharps containers that we have in the trucks or the garbage can out in the truck bay. Regulated waste is anything that has blood or OPIM, or if we squish it, if we compress it, blood or an OPIM can come out of it, um, or certainly contaminated sharps, which we should not have here. <coughs> um, they're leak-proof containers. They get double-bagged. Don, do you want to talk about that process real quick? How okay. No. <laughs> um, basically, you're just going to double bag it up so it's not leaking. They can't transport anything that's leaking with wet. Basically, contaminate it. Correct. And then it's going to contaminate everything else in the transport truck. So everything has to be double bagged, and then they go in a cardboard box that gets taped. So lots of prevention efforts to take care of the people who have to transport this to dispose of it ultimately. Okay. Um, Regulated waste has to be removed within 24 hours if it's a public access facility. So, you know, this stuff isn't like sitting at a hospital or an urgent care or something, again, just brewing in the heat in a garbage can that you're going to open to put your coffee grinds in. Okay? 
Um, so we strive for that same 24 hours here as well. Post exposure, if all of our mass prevention efforts have failed, God forbid, you get exposed to something, two things need immediate attention. Obviously, immediately notify an officer, okay? Because we have to begin investigation of the incident within 24 hours. The sooner we can do that, the easier it's gonna be. And then, the medical treatment needs to begin. That Erie County Emergency Services Exposure Protocol, we follow that. Um, if for some reason you ever get exposed, I will let you know how that is. Um, but it you know, winds up going to ECMC, getting some blood work done, getting some tests done, depending on what, what happened to you, letting Dr. Tackett's know, um, and then again, really investigating the incident. And a lot of times, is it our own fault? Sometimes, is it our own fault? Yeah, I'll answer that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, again. He's been exposed multiple times. Just rhetorically speaking, are we putting our gloves on? Are we wearing the proper PPE on all of these calls? Okay. Record keeping is one of the, the last things covered in the SOP for exposure control. Medical records have to be kept for 30 years. So your physicals, the Sharps injury log, anything that has to do medically related with you, we have to keep for 30 years <coughs> after you're done here. So lots of paperwork. I was talking with Ray and, and Rick about paperwork for PCRs. Thank goodness, PCRs we only have to keep for six years unless they're under 18, in which case we have to keep it for three years after they turn 18. So if we treat an infant, we could potentially be holding the PCR for 21 years. All right. um, so we have tons of paperwork. I think they're looking at streamlining that and finding a way to you know, minimize the amount of equipment or paperwork that we have around here. Training record, all this stuff that's happening here, I have to keep these for at least three years according to OSHA. Um, I have to include the PowerPoint, who was here, what I talked about, what my qualifications are. That has to be for three years. However, New York State CME, those of you who are EMTs and research with them, I need to keep it for seven years for you. So just piles and piles of paperwork that we have to maintain. Bottom line, that was as quick as I could get through the bloodborne pathogen PowerPoint. You're not done. Uh, that, those are all the places that I was at today to try and get the most up-to-date information. There's just gobs of information out there. CDC, World Health Organization are probably the two primary ones, uh, but a lot of them like AIDS.gov. You know, you have to make sure when you're looking at information that it's from a reliable source. You know, like you think, you hear college professors say this all the time, the kids are gonna do a paper on something. You know, you can't just Wikipedia something because anybody can add something to Wikipedia. It's not a verifiable source. So, you know, the .gov, Sources are pretty pretty accurate, but lots of different places to get information. So if you need any more, I have mountains of it. Let me know if you have questions. Cute little video I know you guys saw last year on why we have to wear our PPE. I wouldn't like to sit with that in my pants either. It did happen in college. Can you leave that bottle alone, honey? Can you put it down? Oops. Honey, Sarah, Sarah, come on up. Sweet. I'll have you back in your warm little bed in one second. Hang on, don't fall. Now, we're not changing diapers on calls, however, that potential exists. I have been on childbirth calls, we had just last week a rectal bleeding call, it could happen. So just protect yourself, okay? Pretty much sums up, wear your PPE, wash your hands. I can't say that enough. All right, that's... That's the bottom line of bloodborne pathogens. You nasty stuff out there, don't bring it home. We have all of this stuff here to protect yourself, use it. It is five minutes to eight. Do you guys wanna take a break before we begin the second? Yes, we're gonna do that. I will see you, it's actually six minutes to eight. Let's, let's try and make it eight o'clock and I'll go as fast as I can. What's that? Exactly. Oh yeah, you're done? Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs>
Yeah. No, I think words. So, uh, yes, so let's see, what do you want to make? The, 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 the online word is cheap. What the bank